to welcome welcome to stone soup tonight thank you as we uh, not only kick off national poetry month here at stone soup poetry but also kick off uh kick off kick off the last part of our countdown to our 50th anniversary we're still figuring out what to do because boston cambridge there was a question as to whether or not we were going to be able to do anything during the lockdown uh, case in point there's a poetry mashup that's happening in cambridge we were told that there's a uh, stop on holding events even in the park, even though the parks are still always full, which is kind of weird. But we are allowed to have an event if we can get a restaurant or other outlets. So it's very strange that we can't gather outside, but if we get a place indoors where we can all breathe on each other, that's good. So things are, we are living in very strange times. I only bring that up because the Cambridge Poetry Matchup is starting this weekend. And I will be one of the hosts for the online capacity. It's going almost fully online, except for the uh, Youth Slam Youth uh, Showcase, which is taking place on May 1st. Coincidentally, uh, that day also marks the 50th anniversary of Stone Soup Poetry, which was founded in 1971 by Jack Powers. If you guys are interested in a celebration and hearing diverse voices that don't come around all the time, I will let you know. And uh, if you're asking for a link to the Stone Soup Facebook page, I'll uh, link that here. The Cambridge Poetry Mashup does not have a um, Facebook page, but it does have a main page. I'll link that up later today, uh, later during the show. Uh, the Cambridge Poetry Matchup will hopefully uh, have some more information as to when the online venue is, and I'll have some control of that starting this weekend. I'll either be here at my house coordinating from here, or I'll be on site. But my, in my opinion, as dangerous as it can be, we might, we're all social distancing. All of us have had our shots that are gathering and, you know, you kind of need a command center to be in one room, you know, as much as online Zoom calls are, you need at least uh, the brain trust to be in one location. So we'll hopefully be there and we'll be introducing the features. The features are going to be uh, Reggie Gibson and Jade Sylvan. Uh, look those people up. They are fantastic uh, presences and the uh, presences on the Boston poetry scene. Uh, Reggie Gibson has been performed on, has performed on national public radio. He's been in movies. He has been all around the world and all around the media. Jade Sylvan is a uh, playwright and musical writer. She actually had um, a musical slated until the pandemic took it away, but I think she's working towards actual live, actual film recordings of this. Um, so she's been busy as well. So these are the events that are going to happen this coming weekend. And if you follow the Stone Soup web uh, Facebook page, there'll be more information on that. And hopefully I'll be able to find the mashup page and uh, link it after I am through with the introductions. Um, John Rush is our, is it Rush or Rock? I, it's, I've heard two to three different pronunciations for that name, actually. Uh, it's just Roach. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought. I went to Louisiana where the, where the French live. And when I said my name was, last name was Parento and they asked me how it was spelled, I heard like 16 <laughs> different enunciations of that, so. Well, it, you know, my name's been Irish for a thousand years. So whatever the French pronunciation was, we forgot. <laughs> and so do the people who settled in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, sad to say. Anyway, um, where we, all of us are default like, oh, at the end. So we all sound Italian. Even if it, whether there's a U, E, A, U, or an X at the e, U, X at the end, we're all oh, <laughs> we tried to blend, <laughs> we tried to blend amongst the Irish, but at any rate, uh, John Roche is our feature tonight. This is an amazing uh, feature, and someone I wanted to get on Stone Soup's stage. And the one good thing about the pandemic is that we can do this virtually. We have a virtual stage. And John, as I mentioned online, got me got uh, to know me by writing to me and uh, also sending a copy of his uh, very first Chronicles of uh, Joe the Poet, the, um, the, the very first book from Foothills Publishing. The continuing saga of Joe has just been released from Foothills. And uh, I highly urge you to get that. If John doesn't post the link, I definitely will. John is also welcome to uh, publish his PayPal link or his Venmo if he has so. And I do encourage donations through here as well. So this is gonna be an exciting night, a lot of new material. And uh, John has been a very busy person in the last decade I've come to know him. And it's a near decade I've come to know him. And not only just publishing the survival anthologies but doing the Mojo anthology, he, he never, never stops. And it's very exciting to 
see that energy. It gives me, uh, oh, and Jules just encouraged to donate to the Poetry Playhouse and click and uh, to visit that site and click the button. You'll see that link there. It's a great cause. So without any further ado, without any better segue other than saying without any further ado, I am going to bring it to the open mic. And we're going to introduce uh, the first person on the open mic, uh, someone who has actually been a uh, not just a new addition to this online world of Snow Soup, but also a contributor um, to Oddball Magazine, which is an official partner of Stone Soup and also a uh, past Stone Soup feature. Not content to rest on his laurels, he's zooma zooming wherever he can. Let's welcome up John Wesick. Oh, thank you, Chad. Um, so uh, I recently had a very infuriating encounter with the healthcare system. And so I wrote a brand new poem about it. It's called Pre-Op. As I sit in a hospital gown, face flushed, head almost bursting, needle in a vein on the back of my hand. The monitor reveals all the broken glass in my heart. Decades of fear, rejection, and bottled up resentment. The paper shredder that chopped my career into confetti and the internet porn that refused me a ride home from surgery, no matter how often I asked. Whiskey didn't kill the pain, just delayed it. Can't bluff my way through anymore. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Um, I do appreciate you guys keeping on mute as the poet speaks, but if you have any compliments uh, other than a virtual hand clap, waving hand or hand clap, uh, definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, definitely uh, let them, definitely uh, encourage to do so. You can definitely talk over me until it's time to introduce the next poet, which incidentally, it's time to introduce the next poet. This next poet is one of our uh, telephone contributors, not all of Stone Soup's Illuminati are able to join via a computer, but thanks to the phone system that is Zoom, it's an amazing system. We have people who are not as computer savvy or not as computer owning able to join us. And one of those friends is a past Stone Soup feature open mic participant. Let's welcome up Nancy Dodson, who has to take a minute to unmute herself. I put her on early because she's got to watch that Hemingway show. You know, so we got our story, so no judge. Nancy, great to have you. Let's uh, hear what you got to say. Oh, tell the time, thy beautiful clock. The whole world tells the time. Some hours ahead in the UK, some hours behind in the USA. Never late, but exactly so. One wakes with the chimes, resting as I'm always asleep. I hope the beauty is loved by the hand-painted figures of cats running as the cats here chiming. Oh, tell thy time, thy beautiful clock. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. Thank you very much, Nancy. Enjoy your time, enjoy the rest of your time uh, listening with us. Uh, Nancy is a, a good listener. It's always good to have those as well as participants. I also found um, during Nancy's poetry uh, time, the link to the Cambridge Poetry Mashup, the schedule I can tell you right now, although the features are accurate, the uh, times and places do need revision because we're gonna be going near 100% virtual, but uh, Tony, Tony B created the mashup uh, a year ago and intended on, on having it then, but sadly the pandemic intervened. She's not only holding this event, she's also trying to do it as independently from the town so no one has creative control, and she's also asking for donations as well. So if God help you, God love you if you have extra bucks, consider throwing a few that our way, or I should say her way. I'm not taking a, a dime or taking any payment for my participation. I just want to see this event happen. It's got some amazing events, uh, some amazing people behind it. Moving on to the next feed, the next uh, open mic. Let's welcome up. I'll be excited about, as excited about this as he is because uh, this is the first time I've heard him, Mr. G.E. Schwartz. Thank you very much. Great to be here. And great, obviously, to be here for John, too, because I really want to hear a whole bunch of his stuff at one place. 
This is called the novel of us. The novel of us is a remembrance of a lakeside park called Werewind, where former poplars spiraled in their confessional susurrations and our ageless others played at their lengths of years singing under the chorus of sun and how all of this will be never now. This chorus of us, this novel of us, this song of us clangs along with its plot, with its systems of a darkness, of hometowns, with a mundane traffic veneers the surface over calibans of our brokenness, over crenulated hoaxes, over our shift, our niece afforded by unconscious love and despair. This novel of us takes us to the streets, white as lint, dissolving all arguments, dulling and voiding all differences, discarding the plaster cast of footprints of our claimed once sugarcoating all we know of our unchecked wind of time when face to face we were dispelled, untitled by world. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was fantastic. Hope you're not a stranger. Uh, we got a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks. It'd be good to see any of you guys here again. Uh, moving on to the next person on the open mic. Uh, looks like we're getting more and more people joining, which is always exciting. Let's welcome up uh, one of our other newbies who I hope I can find. Ah, there he is, Mr. Scott Norman. There you go. See. Um, all right. Um, sorry. Uh, these two they sort of they sort of go together just because I put them together. Censorship for the Esmeralda crew. If the sky god tells you to be silent in the night, you can say that you've seen rainbows you remember the flood and you're going to sing. The next one is, um, it's a Kaddisha death prayer for Meyer Kahani and Daniel Kyer, Kiner, Jewish, racist, gone. Sleeping on grates and in doorways where the echo of the law falls and the rain goes. Poor people throw stones at soldiers. Boundaries of nations shatter. Go, dance with Hitler in hell or climb the fountain of eternity to the throne of the divine. But go, leave us alone, let us live. Thank you very much, sir. That was great. We are going to see who's coming up next. I have a couple I hope of people it wasn't to too political. What's that? I hope it wasn't too political. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Ah, and here we are with the woman who is uh, recommending our donations go to the uh, poetry. So, so many things, so many things uh, but the Poetry Playhouse, there's so many names I've just been hawking and promoting and reading about that have the name Poetry in it. I got, I got uh, mixed up. Yeah, she was promoting the Poetry Playhouse, which you can donate to in appreciation for John's upcoming feature, uh, upcoming in the next uh, half hour or so, I'm hoping. Let's welcome up, Jules Nyquist. Thank you, Chad. It's an honor to have um, be here and have an open mic while we're honoring John. So um, yes, yeah, poetryplayhouse.com. And I'm the founder of that in um, started out in Albuquerque and then Placidas. And John is a part of that as well. I'm just going to read one poem from my new book, Atomic Paradise, um, hot off the press here as of December. It's about uh, nuclear war and the war and the Cold War. So this one is called Order 9066. It takes you back to February 19th, 1942, where uh, this, there was a lot of uh, kind of fake news back then as well. 
the idea of putting American Japanese and concentration camps on American soil is fantastical. The newsreels are frightening you, dear one. They want you terrified. They want to upstage a giant ape climbing a skyscraper or lizard attacking our people. They'll have the quiet Japanese fellow next door harboring clandestine treachery. If you saw a movie star accusing her gardener of putting poison on her vegetables, it's only an entertainment set ahead of the main feature. Have faith in our president, Mr. Roosevelt, dear friend. He is saluted like the American flag. So long in office, most were children and can't remember anyone else. He is our kind of Lenin charting the new American revolution, supported even by the communists in the last election. Now the president has even proposed a tax on business so they can't profit from the war and food prices are regulated fair for all. Preposterous that we cannot trust our government to take care of us for the good of the war. And if you want to know more about that, including um, Santa Fe, which had one of the internment camps, you can check out Atomic Paradise. Thanks. Thank you, Jules. Let's see who we have next in our star-studded lineup. Ah, uh, yes, we have the last of our, let me just make sure of something. It looks like someone's trying to, might be contacting me to get on the call and can't. Oh, looks, looks like we're all set. I think CC Oshawa just joined us and we'll put, I'll put you on the open mic as well, sir. Um, this is our last person who will be joining us via via phone. This is someone who I am so glad is still with us because I got, she worried us a little bit there because she was in, uh, she was doing recovery. She was doing, um, she was basically, she was recovering uh, physics, doing physical therapy when the, when the coronavirus hit. So she wasn't even at her house when she was doing this. I don't think she even had, a. I, I'm not even sure if she had books with her, but she was doing poems off the top of her head and uh, she was doing a phenomenal job and did an amazing feature later that summer for the uh, Boston Poetry Marathon, which is an annual event where over a hundred poets perform. And uh, there'll be information on that as well. They had the first um, online event, all online event last, uh, last, last summer. And for this person to have also not only be part of Stone Super, but to be part of this, well, I thank the miracle of technology. And I thank and welcome Miss Carol Weston, who, hopes, who I hope realizes I'm talking about her. And yes, yes. we'll start talking. Hi, Carol. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a very big problem with my Aegean stables. Do I need Hercules to clean out my Aegean stables? by altering the course of a river. And uh, this is to Fred Lawrence, who suggested that my household resembled the Aegean stable. How can I lift the treasure from the mass of aspirations tripping me on my voyage across the floor? I have to hold on to the magic of everything I ever touched I love these strange visitors to my life. I lie down with them. I kiss the egg and I kiss the spoon and I kiss the books individually, though I may not dare to read them. I have to keep words of every child who explored um, his or her way across my classroom the room of the universe. I love every person and every speck. If I could encompass the whole living world and its eons of 3.5 billion year history, I would embrace the sun. Thank you. Yay, Carol. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carol. I'm going to uh, meet you again. Uh, you're muted, but not forgotten. And hopefully we'll have you with whatever, with whatever we decide to, sell, to do to celebrate on the first. Um, I'm hoping to shoot for on the first for Stone Soup, a kind of a combination of live and uh, 
on like in in-house and online event obviously there's a lot of people including people who i wanted to feature who have been uh say have gotten shots but have had health issues so i'm doing my best to use my discretion see what happens ironically where i live now there's actually a community center literally right behind me from where i'm sitting and it has not been allowed to open until the uh, restrictions are lifted i don't know if the restrictions are going to be lifted between now and uh April 30th, but we can hope. And if there, that is, if that is going to happen, maybe we can plan something. But but barring that, we will hopefully uh, figure out what to happen. What will happen? In either way, there will definitely be an online link, and we hope you can join us. And join us um, on the 21st for Gloria Monahan, who is a teacher at Wentworth Institute of Technology. She's their sole poetry teacher and a poetic force and out with a new book as well for the 21st. The 14th, I don't have a, a, an announced feature yet because the person who was originally scheduled, um, David Leo Seurat, was had to move from the 14th to the 28th. So hopefully I have like 12 hours to make an announcement tomorrow. We'll, uh, we'll figure that out. Until then, let's move to the Next open micer. This person is not only a past uh, feature or past host of Stone Soup, but also a contributor visually to Oddball Magazine. Ask about his photography. Um, his photos actually graced my recent book that came out last summer. Um, it's great to have him here tonight with us. Let's welcome up Mr. Ed Galt. Thank you. Um... My brother and I are about 11 years apart, and this poem is about a dream I had when he was about one, I guess, and had a sickness. So I had this dream he was drowning. <laughs> and so I uh, wrote this poem about it um, somewhat years later. <laughs> um, it's called Paralysis. It was easy for my father to say it was only a dream. He wasn't there to see Steve's infant face bobbing in the water as it flowed down the river, looking up at me as I stared down from the bridge, unable for some reason to make a move, either to leave or save him. All I could do is watch as his face slowly drifted down the river. Um, still looking up at me with those dead and trusting eyes asking me why I simply stared into the cereal toast and juice feeling sick thank you thank you Jay. thank you Ed and check out oddballmagazine.com for a sampling of his work. Uh, we not only feature uh, poetry, poetry from uh, various columnists and what have you, we also feature, feature, feature poetry once a month, um, in particular National Poetry Month, uh, once a year I should say, every National Poetry Month, the uh, visual artists come out with their own works and Ed's uh, poetry should be featured later on this month on Oddball, so stay tuned for that. This might be the first time he's finding out about it, but um, I owe you email, Ed, so we'll talk. But at any rate, uh, that's oddballmagazine.com. And we have a lot of people on the open mic. It's uh, growing and it's uh, fantastic. So we're gonna keep on moving on and we're gonna bring up uh, Jan Rowe. Hi, for a change, I have a non-political poem. This is by Carol Jean Smith, a poet who lives in Watertown. The gardener plants early peas in a trench, tosses them like handfuls of stars into the dark. Their number will multiply. The cold early light sings them up, up, up. A phototropic song. We too. Thank you. Carol Jean Smith. Thank you very much, Jan. And let's see who we have next. Ah, well, let's have a musical interlude with the man who I call, used to call the pulse of stone soup. He's really the pulse of Boston. He lends his musical talents 
to a number of venues and outlets and creative form, creative out, creative forms. Um, he's performed for the national. He's performed for the Boston Celebrates National Poetry Month. Um, events. He's performed for Stone Soup and Open Micers many a time. Check out my YouTube. I have him uh, spotted in a couple of areas there. And um, well, let's just introduce the man we all call by his real name, thankfully, Ethan Mackler. Thank you, Chad. Cool. I wanted to do an instrumental, which is an instrumental uh, uh, interpretation of James Van Louis' signature uh, line, it's all one thing. So this is all one thing. In musical, in musical terms, it goes, it's all one thing, it's all one thing, it's all one thing, it's all one thing. Back to you, Chad. Very nice, very nice indeed, Mr. Mackler. Thank you very much for the musical interlude. And now we go back to the uh, spoken marathon, as I'm starting to call it. It's a great turnout tonight. And we have one of our friends joining us via cell phone. So we may see his face, we may not, but he is here. And I'm just about to ask him to unmute Mr. Fitzgerald. Chris Fitzgerald uh, was with us at the uh, regular Stone Soup events that took place, not just at the Isle of the Blue, but at the, uh, the church down by Park Street, whose name escapes me because I've been working as an essential worker for 40 hours a week for a whole freaking year. Um, sorry, Jan, and, and James, but um, it's good that he's able to join us tonight and join us uh, pretty more or less regularly on the open mics as well. Let's welcome up Chris Fitzgerald. Can you hear me, Chad? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. I mean, I have three points. I'll just do two. But I mean, uh, this is a thing I've done about 25 years. And a lot of people there have heard it a couple of times. Three poems all concerned with the poet's first responders. Mom and dad, mom and pop, father and mother. Though the third poem, it's just mother. I don't know where dad was the day of the third poem. Checking the air pressures of the car tires on the driveway. Seeing if the frost had hurt the pumpkin, or maybe just kicking back with one of those drinks with the umbrellas in them. His presence in that poem wasn't required. The first poem is Philip Larkin's This Be the Verse. This is the old world against the new world. Shakespeare and Milton against Emerson Whitman. 
this be the verse. The old world's nothing new under the sun. Just the past over and over and over. Nothing new under the sun. Just the past, blah, blah, blah. Piss and moan, moan and piss. Your father's an asshole, you're an asshole. Your mother's an asshole, you're an asshole. Fixed ideas, choking off anything new. Bernard Shaw once wrote, America and Great Britain, two countries separated by a common language. This is Philip Locke and this be the verse. They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. This is, uh, this is where this all started. I did a, when Charles Bukowski died, I did a thing for him in Cambridge and this is where this all came from. Charles Bukowski died in March of 94. Someone has to read his poems aloud now that Charles is unable. Bukowski wrote in a confessional style. I write in a confessional style. Confessional poetry isn't the same as church confessions or police confessions. A church confession is a person admitting to sinful behavior to a priest. A police confession is a person admitting to illegal activity to a policeman. Confessional poetry is concerned with the wonderful sounds of the language when it is alive. Right doing or wrong doing are not the primary concern. It is. That fourth grade poem of mine entitled What I Did Before My Summer Vacation that little girl who sat in front of me in class, who I made laugh all year long, who I ended up blaming my impeachment as class president. That may or may not have happened, but that wasn't why I got impeached. The real reason had to do with my pal who lived across the street from me, who I would call to walk to school with me. He would often be 10, 15 minutes late, thus making me 10, 15 minutes late. But that wouldn't make lively confessional poetry. Frig him anyways. He cost me my presidency. Now he wants into my poetry. I'm sorry, I don't think so. Bukowski's confessions are similar. No matter what shit the world threw at him, he was always able to reach down, hallelujah anyways. Never gave me the impression he ever wasted one moment of his life feeling sorry for himself. He never let the group identify him. He identified himself. He knew the world wasn't competent to handle that responsibility. The man had the backbone of a great American from the last century, Crazy Horse. This poem is also a tufa. He not only portrays a richly intense life, 1930, but he also kills a spider at the end of the poem, a Chilean recluse spider. I'm sure everyone remembers the Chilean recluse spider who was responsible for the deaths of 14 Los Angelinos in 1921, 1929. He not only succeeds artistically, but he makes the world a little safer at the end of the poem for poetry readers and non-readers alike. Now, this is one of his last published poems, a poem written by a man in the 70s, but it seems to possess all the vigor and tenacity of a 12, 13-year-old boy who has but 10 minutes to convince two of his pals to hook school with him today. Charles Bukowski, Me Against the World. This is Los Angeles, 1930. Brother, can you spare a dime? If you can't, you get changed for a quarter. This is Bukowski. When I was a kid, one of the questions asked was, would you rather eat a bucket of shit or drink a bucket of piss? I thought that was easy. That's easy, I said. I'll take the piss. Maybe we'll make you do both, they told me. I was a new kid in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah, I said, yeah, they said. There were four of them. Yeah, I said, you and whose army? We won't need an army, the biggest one said. I slammed my fist into his stomach and all five of us were down on the ground fighting. They got in each other's way, but there were still too many of them. I broke free and started running. Sissy, sissy, they yelled, going home to mama. I kept running. They were right. I ran all the way to my house, up the driveway and onto the porch and into the house where my father was beating up my mother. She was screaming, there were things broken on the floor, 
I charged my father and started swinging. I reached up, but he was too tall. All I could hit was his legs. Then there was a flash of red and purple and green. And I was on the floor. You little prick, my father said. You stay out of this. Don't hit my boy, my mother screamed. But I felt good because my mother was not no longer getting hit. By, my father was no longer hitting my mother. To make sure I got up and charged him again swinging, it was a flash of colors and I was on the floor again. Then I got up again. My father was sitting in one chair. And my mother was sitting in another chair. And they both just sat there looking at me. I walked down the hall and into the bedroom and sat on the bed. I listened to make sure there weren't any more sounds of beating and screaming out there. There weren't. Then I didn't know what to do. It wasn't any good outside and it wasn't any good inside. So I just sat there. Then I saw a spider making a web across the window. I found a match, walked over, lit it and burned the spider to death. Then I felt better, much better. Uh, so we get time for the third one. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Chris, we still have to uh, move. We have to move on. Okay, okay, okay. Much. We can bring it next week. Okay. But uh, thank you very much. That was uh, Chris Fitzgerald, everybody. We have, we have... So we have um, we have up next on the open mic, uh, Paulette Warren, one of our one of our other new joinees. I'm going to uh, put her on gallery view again so I can make sure she's here and ask her to unmute herself. Oh, there hey, you are. Um... I'm trying to start my video. Sorry, hold on just a second. Oh, look like it's starting now. It caught me, it caught me eating dinner, and I actually, <laughs> I actually didn't know that I had signed up. So this is interesting. <laughs> but I've got a poem, so I'm just grabbing it. Mm, excuse me. Mm. No worries. No worries. I'm sorry, everyone. Mm. That's what happens when dinner's ready at poetry reading time. Okay, this is called. Um, Locus of Howl, that's Howl, H-O-W-L, all in caps. Do not mistake the lure of cinnamon, not cinnamon, I'm starting over. Do not mistake the lure of synonym. Howl is not siren pitched to wine, nor coyotes yip, nor bloodhounds bay, not painful yowl or warning bark, not squeal, squawk, screech, or scream. Nor does howl exist with laughter. That is hoot or shriek or cackle. Howl belongs to wind and wolf and wilderness. Howl is felt before heard like a lake's roiling cauldron below the icy surface. Earth's silent tremors before a seismic quake. Howl, howl rumbles up from guts level, sudden irreversible moment of clarity, ripping the veil from your naked soul. Howl is the raging roar of disillusion, the keening wail of the vast unknown. Howl is baby's birthing wail, soldier's battle cry. When he gasps, I can't breathe, that is whimper. When he cries out, mama, that is howl. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank that was you. That fantastic, and let me, um... I'll go back to gallery view. Yes, I, I just saw the comment from Jewel saying we all you all got automatically signed up. Yes, yes, I'm the poetry press gang. Ah, who is next? I didn't know. I didn't know. Who's next, matey, <laughs> to sign up? Let's um, let's let's welcome up John Hicks. He looks like a suitable sir, scurvy swab. Mr. Hicks, are you available? Yep. I. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me? I cannot hear myself. I can hear you. Okay, good. I've got to be real quick because dinner is coming out of the oven in less than two minutes. So this is Crossings. This is a seven line poem called A Seven Lane. Three rivers, three stones, the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Missouri, three skips into each, in two, not across. Each river crossing a new beginning. Ceremonies. Three worthy worries each left to tumble downstream. Thank you. Ah, that was too quick. 
get off me ship. Okay, sorry. I will. <laughs> I am um, sorry for the impressions. It's usually that not this, usually not this plucky, but I blame it on sleep deprivation since on Sunday night. Well, so, I said seven it? lines and you got seven. I, I know. I, you, you did deliver, matey. Okay. <laughs> no, but seriously, thank you very much for that contribution. This has been a great... Uh, has been a great contribution from a lot of new voices. We're going to go to some of our familiar faces now to close things off. We'll be closing off with the man who does say it's all one thing. So we're interested in his work. There'll be more of a segue with details later. But for now, let's go to the man who has uh, been serving as a teacher this entire time, all taking advantage of the, uh, the Zoom generation, the Zoom revolution, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the Zoom mass interrogation spy technique. <laughs> we're, it's like Facebook, we're our own worst enemies. No, but seriously, uh, this person has been a teacher, he's been an instructor, he's been a uh, poet performer, he's been James Madison. True story. Let's welcome up Mr. Bill Lewis. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is such an honor to have my minions to bow before me in adulation when you are as great and marvelous as I am. It is still a pleasure to see the little ones show their admiration and their appreciation for the things that we great people do. Ah. It is after all on the heads of giants that I have walked. <laughs> Oh, I came on late because I was visiting one of my heroes, my heroines. If you've ever heard of this gal, Temple Grandin, she is uh, a woman who is severely autistic, but she had a great mind and she is able to persevere and do things. And that is, of course, the lesson that you know, I keep hitting people with, you know, I, I just echo her all the time. Yeah, yeah, are you weird? Yes, I'm about that weird. Does it make any difference? That's only a reason to work harder, get out there, do it, do it, do it. And, you know, and you've seen me jumping up and down and screaming at kids and you can do this stuff and doing stuff. And so um, anyway, she was speaking uh, an hour ago. And so I went to her talk and I copied that slide off of her because because you know that's where it is and so like after all this time i've i've been taking a lot of um negativity from people about oh the world is going to hell oh we're gonna end oh everybody's dying oh the millennials can't do anything they can't have a job they can't buy and now in the middle of this pandemic i'm seeing just the opposite i'm seeing millennials who do do things, millennials who are buying houses, who are building companies and moving ahead and making money and hiring people and building a better world. And I get all excited and I say, thank God, I just thought the world was going to hell in a handbasket. And it is I who was going to hell in a handbasket or my imagination. And the world is in wonderful shape. My God, the future is so bright. We need sunglasses. Now is the time. Move forward, move forward. Oh, my friends, what opportunities we have. What glory to explore the world on Zoom, to go anywhere you want and meet people that you never have met before. Oh, we are truly, truly blessed. We are the generations of generations. A plague came. A plague came. And nobody died. I mean, somebody died, but not 10 million people, not 100 million people. This is not the plague of 1918. It is a miracle. There is a vaccine. It is coming to an end just magically. Oh my God, what world do we live in that magic can descend upon us in such a fashion? We are blessed, we are blessed, we are blessed. Thank you that I can live in this glorious age and give my educational opportunities to those who come after me to know that my students will have a better life than I do is the most important thing for me to feel as a teacher because I am successful and they will have better lives. And I just, 
my hero, another one of my heroes, was Walt Disney. I met him once when I was a kid, just at the end of his life, before I worked um, at Disneyland. But there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. And tomorrow is just a dream away. You have a dream and that's a start. You follow your dream with mind and heart. And when your dream becomes a reality, it's the dream come true for you and me. There, the great, big, beautiful tomorrow, shining at the end of every day. There, the great, big, beautiful tomorrow. And tomorrow is just a dream away. Thank you, Bill. Up next, this man's been a uh, Stone Soup uh, documenter, a Stone Soup host, a Stone Soup feature a band leader, a radio show host, a venue host uh, on the virtual world currently. Let us welcome up the man uh, no, the man we all call, and thankfully he calls himself this too. I think I've used that joke today already. Oh, well, the hell with it. Mr. Sisi, Sisi Ashagra. Hello. How are you? Sure um, I just want a little quick update. Um, I know that uh, there are some of you waiting to do the, the, the event that I'm producing on Sunday. And um, there's been a couple of setbacks, the blah, 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 the, the, the host uh, family problem, the, 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 the web designer had to go away. And, and, and then a couple of people that were helping on tech got sick, uh, not from COVID. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of doing this Sunday with a focus on freedom of speech. In other words, it's gonna be a low key step back. This is a three step uh, brand new concept. It's an open microphone hybrid. I'm gonna put the link now in the chat and then I'm gonna read the poem. There's gonna be an email there. You got any questions, let me know. But basically it's an open mic followed by nonprofit community organizations and groups followed by a individual free speech. In order to participate in this living work of art, which is what I'm calling it, and the, there's this thing called principles of involvement. And it's just basically, a, uh, I, I'll explain if you do it. I don't want to do it now because time is short and we got a lot of readers. So I'm just going to go ahead and read a poem now. So thank you for that. And uh, here's a little something for later on in the chat. This is from a new manuscript I'm working on. It's untitled. We are born with divine light of being, a whole self to be and a form to pass through. As coming of age escapes, you are tortured to survive sex alone, not programmed to serve the fear of love. And without a young mind formed, war's realities bind you to parent the lessons your parents yet earned the traumas of no love do try to protect you and at the same time you inherit the very ways fear fears love then with or without hatred's innocence alone you experience attraction if unviolated your first crush becomes a brush with death to find on your own this new threshold of pain is. You are not in control of any person or persons. Your free fall cannot demand your choice falls with you. And then comes real liking, then pure infatuation. And if there's a mutual moment that lasts, one to last longer than right now, long as time can suspend true to belief 
is, but never as far as this choice belongs to two. Alone comes a human's first love born to truths born to honestly die. A heartbreak, you are broken. Your own honesty kills you. You just risked life and love gave you what you looked for. You're now free to be hateful and cruel, unforgiving, to lie wasting that you looked for love and a hole in truth found you. And all the love you found is now free to hate truth and never choose trust love again, forgetting love itself did nothing to hurt you, to leave love for survival, to leave boundless, to be bound, because now you are more important than love is, more important than honestly love itself lives. That's it. So that's just a rite of passage poem kind of a thing filled with all the trials that we, uh, I tried to write one of those. That's, that's, a, that's not an easy uh, task. So I don't know if that poem achieved it or not, but uh, that's it. Thank you. So there it is again. Any questions at all? There's the email, uh, the human room open voice at Gmail. And uh, anyone interested in helping out or doing anything like that? This is a long range project, the human room open voice. This is gonna be, it's too much to explain now. Just go ahead and go to the website, buttonwood.org has a thing about it. Principles of involvement, any questions, let me know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We got some links to visit, but um, thank you so much, CC. And uh, we have two more people on the open mic, it seems. The uh, second to last person I wasn't expecting to come today because I thought you'd have a lot going on because not only is he the founder of Oddball Magazine, not only is he the founder of the Oddball Foundation, which was formed during the pandemic last year, but it's also his birthday today. So um, I'm hoping he could take a couple minutes. I'm sure he's, he's taking time to read, to, to listen to us. I'm sure he can take a couple minutes to read a poem. Ladies and gentlemen, let's wel welcome up. Mr. Jason Wright. Happy birthday, Jason. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks. Hey, thank Jason. you. Hey. Hey, Chad. How's it going, man? Doing great. You got something for us? I do. I do. I have, uh, I have one poem. Uh, the poem that I wrote uh, today. Um, I wrote it yesterday and performed it, performed it on Oddball. Um, you know, I just want to take this time real quick to thank um, uh, a lot of you are friends of mine on Facebook. And I want to thank all the people who have donated today uh, to the Oddball Foundation uh, for my birthday. It's so super awesome. Um, you know, all of your uh, donations are tax deductible and, you know, you can write them off and you're really helping us do some really great stuff. We're building a foundation um, of really good people. We've taken on volunteers and interns and, um, yeah, we just have some really great events planned and, and I really just really appreciate it. So one, if you want to volunteer with us, uh, team at oddballfoundation.org, you can send us any um, you know reason why you'd want to work with us. We have publishing opportunities, marketing, development opportunities, uh, computer work as well. Um, so I just wanna thank you all. Um, I, I appreciate it um, and uh, if it's your birthday coming up, please consider donating um, your your uh, time for team at, for Oddball Foundation for your birthday next time. Um, so, and if you'd like to ever check out oddballmagazine.com, it's oddballmagazine.com. We're always open for submissions all the time, um, and you know, just would, um, you know, thanks, thanks, Ed. Good to see you. Thank you for all your contributions with Oddball. It's awesome. Um, you know, uh, and 
Also, support CC's uh, uh, Human Room Open Voice. Uh, he's doing a really great thing. If you can check it out, it's a lot of fun. He hasn't told you that much about it, but there's a nonprofit part about it. There's a, a, a part for open dialogue and also a really great open mic and musicians uh, and poets and all sorts of cool stuff. So um, my poem here is called um, The Survivor in You. And I'm, and, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read it real quick. So um, actually, no, it's not. It's called Style with Stilo. And it goes like this. Writer's block comes and goes, it's here. It says, hey, I'm here. It says, hey, I'm here in you and I'm trying to take control of the situation. And along comes the pen and says, man, nah, time's to go away, writer's block. The hero is here. Fighting writer's block from block to block, using the pen as a lyrical sword to cut through each word. You blocked, are you in trouble? The pros, pros like Ghostbusters take away the struggle. In come the metaphors like lions, like riders on the storm. Next come the differences at hearing from the norms. Now references come in like Dickens, Foreman, like Voltron. Nostalgia comes in like waiting for the bus, waiting for mom to come home. Then symphony comes in and wonders, why was I alone? Then wonder comes in, is he alluding to a broken home? Then beat come in and says, nah, it's just a break in the constant. And assonance and dissonance come up and shake the honest connotations. Stay brackish, brackish beats, onomatopoeia, bam, there it is. Back to the obscure reference. Tag team, tag it out and back in. Like pro wrestling, add something that someone can relate to and then take it away with something vulgar, fucking insane on a train with peace through pain. That's a reference only the writer gets, right in circles around the crowds, but ain't even close to done yet. Back to the high school bully and the detention centers. Throw a little reference to what's going on in the world. Hashtag stop Asian hate, a call to action to make some people move towards, let them know what today is. It's World Ocean Day. Let them know something they didn't put the poem on pause. Fake it like you're finished and take it to the next level. Go faster, go faster, throw more references in like spinach to Popeye and then take a Tribe Called Quest lyric and put it to the hip hods reference, remix it and electric relax and throw it in the reference. I need a Philly right before I get loose. Money, please, I get loose off of orange juice. Get back to a commercial reference, Tropicana, then go dig in the crates and hit them with Freddie Gibbs, Mad Lib and Bandana. Credit the reference that got your mind stuck on this tempo. This poem is brought to you by DJ Shadow. And cut the transmission, leave them wanting more, then break for a second. Suck them out like a free throw and let them know you're just getting warmed up and go over like an hour or more so. Bring it home with some laughter like Viagra. Cialis, say you're strong like a bull. Bring in a movie reference. Say something corny like, I love you still. Don't ever go away from me. You complete me. Back to the movie synopsis. Jerry Maguire star Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr. About a sports agent with nothing to lose who meets a beauty who challenges him to grow. Looks at his life and sees what is right and ends credits. Leaves the movie alone because life is like a box of rockets. That's the lyrical upset. Listening to preemptive strike, got the fingers typing like Hemingway, writing in a French cafe. I could keep going, but the record comes to the end. And that's the way to get through writer's block. Make a hero, not hold a gun, but that's style with a stilo. That's style with a pen. The end. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. And we are... On our way, yeah, I, lo I love the comment from, I love the comment from uh, Scott Norman saying, Jason, you've completed another solo orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Was that just this past year or is that in the last poem? Anyway, let us, <laughs> uh, let us move on to our, our uh, last person on the open mic. There's a reason we close with this person. Uh, Jason mentioned that he wrote that for Oddball Magazine. We actually have poem columnists at Oddball Magazine at various uh, parts of the week. Uh, Jason has his weekly Jagged Thought. And this next person coming up has his weekly poem column entitled, appropriately enough for tonight, It's All One Thing. And you can read that every Thursday morning at 11 o'clock in the morning without fail at oddballmagazine.com. It combines poetry, theatrics, music, a uh, history of Boston, especially the um, the people on the fringes, like Bill Barnum, Jack Powers, founder of Stone Soup Poetry, and a host of other crazy characters. He's been uh, delving into the, the the history of his uh, complicated family, and um, complicated because it's also from the Dutch language. But um, he's been entertaining us like this for over six years now on a weekly basis. And even longer than that, he's been a presence at Stone Soup Poetry almost since the very beginning and a member of uh, various other troops such as Cosmic Spelunker Theater with the late Bill Barnum. Let's welcome up now, 
to close things out, Mr. James Van Loy. Thanks, Chad. So I've got a poem here called Lucky Me Three. Lucky Me Three. Every decade or so, I have to go through a near death experience which survived so far as each time, like the Nautilus outgrowing its current septum, resulted in a new life slowly recovering, healing until the next onslaught of reality-based trauma occasions a new form of death. So when I was nine going on 10, I got sick and lost several months in hospital alone. So I remembered nothing and looked like those pictures of refugee kids from World War II wandering days, thousand yard stairs and blasted villages or so depressed after two years in US Army and Vietnam era draft he rage at genocidal war that had trapped me worse than GI tract going at both ends at once of childhood reaction to industrial town gang culture and the lead fumes of the cars on Lafayette Street when the ocean freighters closed the bridge but being drafted was nothing to divorce, D-I-V-O-R-C-E. <laughs> when I fell in the closet and almost broke my neck and then took a job that could have killed me if I hadn't stuck my arm in a front end loader and had to spend the years, next two years, just getting back to the use of my left creative side arm. But each crisis produced a new set of practice and each version of myself became more robust, sort of, so far. And here's a little song. That's great. I am working on the innovations all the live long life. I've been working on those innovations just to pass through this time of strife. Can't you hear that supervisor calling? Rise up so early in the morn. Can't you hear the captain shouting? Gabriel, blow that horn. Gabriel, won't you blow? Gabriel, won't you blow? Gabriel, won't you blow your horn? Gabriel, won't you blow? Gabriel, won't you blow? Gabriel, won't you blow your horn? Someone's in the break room with Gabriel. Someone's in the break room with Gabriel. Someone's in the break room with Gabriel. Strum on the left apple and sing and bay by fiddly I O. Bay by fiddly I O. Bay by fiddly I O. Strum on the left. Thanks, folks. Wow. <laughs> and that was just the open mic, ladies and gentlemen. It could be like this every week. All we need is you. And with that, it is time for the main event. Tonight's uh, reason we all gathered here today and I thank him for assembling the, the group that we have today. And I do encourage you to, uh, don't, to uh, make your donations. We'll give you reminders later. And, and uh, hopefully, and there's also links to his uh, books earlier upward in the, um, in the chat. So I, there's also uh, his latest book, The Continuing Adventures, or is it, I forget if it's Continuing or Further Adventures of Joe the Poet. I'll know that when I read the boilerplate, which I'll do right now. Ah, yes, Joe rides again, the further travels of Joe the Poet. 
That is his new book, but let's get to the bio. John Rush, who Rush lives in Casitas, New Mexico, helping his wife Jules Nyquist run uh, Jules Poetry Playhouse. He also edits the Poetry Playhouse publications and hosts the monthly Crack Correctus Poetry Open Mic. He taught literature and creative writing for decades at various colleges, retiring from Rochester Institute of Technology in 2019. He was the former president of Just Poets in Rochester, New York, and as well as a member of the board of BOA Editions, chief organizer of the Black Mountain North Symposium, and an instigator of the annual Cloudburst Council Poets Retreat in the Finger Lakes. Along with editing the five volume press, uh, the Poets Speak series, and other anthologies, including the Mojo Anthology. His own poetry collections include On Consensus, Topicalities, Road Ghost, and the Joe, po Joe Poems, the continuing saga of Joe the Poet. His newest book is Joe Rides Again, Further Adventures of Joe the Poet, which came out last year from Foothills Publishing. Foothills Publishing has both Joe Poems and uh, there's links to the Mojo Anthology via his website. And it's been a thrill to uh, not just read John's work over the years, but uh, to also be part of it very, through the various Poets uh, Speak anthologies and the Joe the Poem ser Poet series. Uh, the Mojo Anthology is one where you could actually create your own version of Joe or your own iteration of Joe the Poet. Joe is basically an immortal poet who's lived either one life for a long time or several lives. Sometimes he's of a different sex, sometimes he's of a different race, sometimes he's doing something completely different. Um, thanks to the Mojo Anthology, I was able to write in the Joe the Poet Cinematic Universe, a meeting between himself and the legendary in our territory, Bill Barnum. Uh, but Best to have him introduce you to Joe the Poet and introduce you him you all to himself. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together 20 to 30 times for Mr. John Rush. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Um, and, uh, as a native New Englander, it's a pleasure to uh, be in Boston again, even if virtually. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the... Um, uh, the Mojo anthology that uh, Chad mentioned came out in 2014 from uh, Beatlick Press in New Mexico, some friends of ours, Beatlick Press, and had people from all over writing their own poems about this, char this character, Joe, who, um, I don't know he, where he came from, or how I learned about him, but uh, I soon discovered he was He'd been around for tens of thousands of years in various guises and, uh, and had the, um, the gall to keep revealing himself through poems. And I kept trying to turn off the spigot, but, but I couldn't. And there's been, uh, as, as Chad mentioned, a series of books now. Um, and uh, but be, before, I want, uh, before I get to the Joe poems, I thought I would start with a few new ones. I uh, mentioned also um, uh, that it, uh, I think Jules will probably put uh, put the links back up again since they're probably way up at the top. But uh, on the Jules Poetry Playhouse, on my book page, on the Poetry Playhouse um, page, um, there's a free PDF of uh, short poems, synquains. I wrote two months of them as we were agonizing in uh, December, January about who would be in fact the president and if there would be a president or a dictator. And uh, I know Chad was, was very supportive of that effort. And so there's a, pr a free PDF that would be at the top of that page of, of the uh, inaugural, the, uh, I think it was called an inaugural uh, wreath of, um, of Sinquains. Uh, and right below that is the, uh, is the new the link for the new uh, Joe Rides Again book. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with um, with a couple of new poems, and then move to the book. And um, <clears throat> this one is uh, is, is um, similar in theme to the to the Sinquains, although a little longer. It's called the Previous Tenants. You hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you never saw such a mess. They turned a white house into a crack house, 
It's going to take us forever and a day to clean it. Cigarette burns in the upholstered chairs, slashed paintings and broken statues, empty liquor bottles and used condoms on the carpets, orange smeared fingerprints and graffiti all over the walls. What does Q mean? The whole climate control system ruined, the burglar alarm smashed. Don't get me started on what they did to the garden. The worst is the hole in the ceiling over the oval room where somebody's meth lab exploded. Now with the November rains and subsequent snows, we've got a lake in there. And that big oaken desk with Moroccan leather top that's always been our pride and joy, well, it's literally floating. And the weird thing about that poem is I wrote it before January 6, right? Before a lot of these things actually happened. Okay. Uh, I a little more serious tone, uh, a lot more serious tone. Um, uh, Earth Day is coming up. And um, uh, this is called Loving Butterflies is Now Punishable by Death. Since they killed Homero Gomez Gonzalez and Raul Hernandez, the butterfly protectors of Mexico. Loving trees is now punishable by death since they killed Paulo Polino Guajara, Zezico Guajara, and three other defenders in the Brazilian Amazon, and Javier Francisco Paro Cubillos in Colombia. Loving birds is now punishable by death ever since they killed Florida game warden Guy Morrill Bradley. Loving endangered gorillas is now punishable by death since they shot Munganga Nzanga jockeys in the Democratic Republic of Congo's Kahuzi Biega National Park. Loving Africa's oldest nature park is now punishable by death. Sorry, uh, since they shot. Fikila Ngazi for opposing the Tendele open cast mine uh, near the national park. Protecting Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo is punishable by death as 20 park rangers have been killed in the past two years and more than 200 in the past decade. Loving the earth is punishable by death, which is why US trained Honduran special forces gunned down Berta Isabel Caceres. Loving the rainforest has definitely been punishable by death all the way back to 1988 when they killed Chico Mendez, all the way back to 1980 when they killed his comrade, Wilson Pinero. Loving lions has been punishable by death all the way to 1989 when George Adamson was murdered in Kenya. Loving the poor and the environment is doubly punishable by death for which they killed sister Dorothy May Stang in Brazil in 2015. Loving the planet has been punishable by death at least since 1985 when French intelligence bombed Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior and killed Fernando Pereira. And it's getting worse. A record 212 environmental activists were killed in 2019 and all indications are that 2020 was at least as deadly. If I told you a lie, if I told you it was so cold and windy last night, a bobcat hopped the 12 foot wall to cuddle up on our patio, it would not be a lie. If I told you we flirted with below zero temps on our little plot of high desert, it would be just a slight exaggeration. If I told you cherry trees will be budding in Burke in a couple of weeks and snow will be gone in a couple of days, that wouldn't be a lie, just a reasonable surmise. If I told you our griefs will melt along with the snows and the traumas of the past year will be subsumed by the aromas of spring flowers, that, yes, that would be a lie. One, one last new one. 
self-isolating in my grandma's upstairs living room. Oh, sorry, this is called self-isolating 1968. So it's a memory triggered, I guess, by the last year. Self-isolating in my grandma's upstairs living room, hiding out from late spring pollens, only room in the house with an air conditioner. Ice pack on arm, swollen like golf ball after allergy shot, reading the death of a president, listening to Eric Burden's Sky Pilot on the radio, the long version. A soldier so ill looks at the Sky Pilot, remembers the words, thou shalt not kill. Sky Pilot, Sky Pilot, how high can you fly? You never, never, never reach the sky. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to turn the focus to the to the new book. <clears throat> and um, this one's called uh, Joe Rides Again. It had been years since anyone spotted Joe. Rumors were flying that he was dead. Folks even consulted the Ouija board or played records backwards to no avail. Then one day in the merry month of May, someone sees Joe pumping gas into a beater car at the Indian owned self-serve near the interstate. They say, Joe, we thought you'd return on a white horse named Mescalero or descend on a marmalade cloud, but here you are looking like ordinary Joe. What you see is what you get, says Joe, as he gets into the driver's seat and his chariot begins to lift. And uh, it's called Joe the Poet's Latest Book. This kind of explains the book, I guess. The book is as told to John Roach. Okay. Joe's preference is to fold his poems into paper airplanes, sail them off canyon walls, bury deep in the wine dark sea, he hides poems under desert rocks on bus stop benches and subway seats, inside Gideon Bibles in fuck motels, inside fast food wrappers under magazines in doctors' waiting rooms and county jails. Somewhere the one who needs one may find their poem. Now Joe has a friend who collects the poems Joe tosses over his shoulder. Joe hasn't exactly agreed to their publication, but neither has he made a fuss. Joe says, don't assume you know the author from the poem. Says all these poems are pale copies of poems written 10,000 years ago, because my memory ain't what it used to be. <clears throat> and how much are you paying per month? Don't forget those added taxes and fees. <laughs> that must be Joe on there. When would-be biographers contacted him, he fended them off. He resented the implication that he... Okay. Maybe it was Joe. Okay. <clears throat> so what you should know about Joe on a first date. One, Joe's been around the block a few million times. Two, Joe could teach Tiresias a thing or two about gender bending, and some say she has. Three, Joe prefers a cafe that's unpretentious, a place where everybody knows your 10,000 names. Four, Joe's got only one outfit and identical ones in the hamper, so Mater D's usually won't let him in. Five, you'd think after all this time, Joe would remember not to order spaghetti on a first date. Six, it's not like Joe means to make his date pay the tab. It's just that all he might have on him at a particular moment is a drachma. Seven, Joe doesn't believe in doing it on a first date. The world's too full of two-bit demigods already. Eight, a melodious voice can unlock Joe's heart. Nine, the stars, the stars, the stars. Ten, Joe's not much of a conversationalist, but he just might write you a sonnet. <clears throat> uh, Joe's hat. Joe wears a poet's hat, chin strapped tight against high desert winds. Joe picked it up on the trail some years back. Ornata del Muerta, 
or was it West Texas? Took it off a skeleton, but the hat was practically new, a bit dusty perhaps, weathered leather giving it character. He lost his last one, along with his cash and one kidney, aims not to make that mistake twice. And uh, <clears throat> Joe's pocket. Joe smokes his last cigarette, not of the day, but of the centuries. It's filled with the taste of earth and ashes. He watches from a mesa as smoke rises from distant burning hills. A mirror flashes and he finds himself on a barren fjord, the last dragon ship having departed and in his pocket, the stone image of a flute playing man. We have volcanoes here in Albuquerque, just west of town. There are five uh, dormant, not extinct, but dormant volcanoes and they're fun to hike. So this is called Joe and the Volcanoes. Of late, Joe's spending time hiking the volcanoes. These aren't the movie kind with savage tribes and vengeful deities demanding virgin sacrifice. They're just dormant, not extinct volcanoes on Albuquerque's West Mesa. These three sisters and two infants are more than 160,000 years old, making them slightly older than Joe, so he respects them. After writing for hours in cave or summit, he'll pick up beer bottles, candy wrappers, and used condoms left by local teenagers. But he does leave each time a penciled poem affixed to Choya spine, his own small prayer flag waving in the desert wind. And uh, <clears throat> Joe's chair. Joe's got a folding chair with his name on it down at the recycling station, the dump as it's affectionately known, a place where everybody knows your name, especially if you're supervisor of plastics and you've been there as long as Joe. He loves chewing the fat with the Wednesday regulars, mostly retirees, warming his hands over a garbage can fire, reciting the odd poem, holding forth on baseball stats and local gossip, but the Saturday crowd are a different brand of customer. Most can't tell a number one from a number five, and he's constantly fishing out the odd can. And uh, uh, we, we visited Sweden, Jules has relatives there, uh, in 2019. So this is called, uh, we went to a, a toy museum in Gemla, in um, Gemla, in the south of Sweden. So this is called Joe the Toy Maker. In Gemla, Sweden, Joe carves wooden horses, designs elegant dollhouses, creates modular toys decades before Legos. His toys, they say, come alive in the imaginations of children. Not surprising since centuries ago, he lived on a floating asteroid and built replicants. And, uh, Um, yeah, here's one that's a little different, um, called Joe Crashes the Grand Slam. And some of you may have come across Silenus if you read your Oedipus Rex or Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy lately. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so Joe Crashes the Grand Slam. Joe's at the big poetry slam with his old friend Silenus, the lame half-blind satyr. Joe and Silenus sit patiently as contestant after contestant declaim their triumph over absurd, uh, sorry, triumph over adversity to crescendos of finger popping, followed by cards reading 9.8, 9.9, even 10. Joe helps Silenus to the stage. The judges puzzled check their lists. Silenus con commences. Count no man happy while he lives. And he concludes, it is best not to be born at all. Next to that, it is better to die than to live. The room goes silent. The judges search frantically for zeros. Joe places the laurel on Silenus. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this one goes, 
a little different direction. Uh, uh, there's going to be a new Foothills uh, publishing anthology of poems about the movies. And this one's going to be in that called Joe at the Movies. <clears throat> Joe loves the movies where he can get glimpses of places he's lived, places he's des destined to live, places he never thought of to visiting, but for the imaginations of the filmmakers. Joe prefers a sparsely populated old fashioned bijou, maybe a weekday matinee where in the dark he can be alone with his thoughts and his popcorn. Joe's wild about international films which aren't foreign to him and black and white silence where his mind supplies the sound and color. Joe did his stint in Hollywood back in its glory days but found himself blacklisted for the crime of just being Joe. When they asked him to name names, he launched into a long litany of people he's been, but they stopped him after Methuselah. As his good friend Charlie Chaplin said, Joe, I make movies for the people, and you're a whole lot of people rolled into one. And uh, <clears throat> do a couple more. Uh, this one, um, <clears throat> the original book, uh, we're, we're all 10 line, I did 10 line poems, Joey, there's under 100 words, 10 lines, the Joey form. This book is, I have some of those, but some that are longer or uh, prose poems. This is a prose poem, Joe the Poet's Bike. Oh, for that old black single speed policeman's bike Joe bought in Dublin through the classifieds when she was young and her gleaming new red five speed had been cut from the gate at Stevens Green. It was sturdy, the policeman's bike was sturdy, it made you feel confident in the saddle and you could ride it in any weather. Its gears were strong enough to propel you over the lip of the Grand Canal or up the high ground past the castle and smooth enough to let you cruise down to Belfield or all the way up to the Phoenix Park. It would guide your way back to Rathgar or Rathmines after that fifth pint. And best of all, no one would try to steal it because it wasn't flashy and it wasn't new and it wasn't American or German engineered. But let me let you in on a secret. It possessed a soul. It was a magic bike, such as you can read about in The Third Policeman or The Crock of Gold. It was a poet bike. Its molecules entered you and your mind entered it. Some strange things could result, but it was a joy to ride and a boon to own. And I think I'm... Um, <clears throat> Um, there are actually some darker poems, climate change and other things, but I'm not in the mood. I'm going to end this with uh, two poems, two short poems. Uh, one is called, uh, one is from a, a, a good poet friend of ours who, who died in 2019, Stuart S. Warren. And it's called Joe and Stuart. Joe meets his old friend Stuart walking Eternity Road. Looks like you have a heavy load, says Joe. It's light as a feather, friend, if your heart is light. That's good to hear, Stuart. Let's walk for a spell. So they walk and they talk and they walk some more. Walk down six crooked highways and up nine straight paths. Stuart and Joe explore seven galaxies and 13 dimensions. Walk the seven bridges road and across the rainbow bridge. And Stuart turns to Joe and says, this is my turn off. We'll meet again, says Joe if the circle be unbroken. And the last, which is actually the last one in the collection, uh, Joe the Poet's April Sonnet. Joe's the original April Fool, head in the clouds, sandal clad feet firmly on the ground, except when he walks off the inevitable cliff. Does he fall? Does he sail? Pop up like some cartoon character? Plunge deep down to the bottom of the sea? And what does he do there? Writes a poem in his head, of course. Sends it up in his trusty water bottle, but all that's found is an empty bottle. What happens next is anybody's guess, but we'll see him again next April, about to make the same mistake as he warbles his song of spring. Thank you all. Hey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands together 30, 40 more times. For Joe the Poet's biographer, John Roche. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Do I hear calls for encore? <laughs> encore.
I heard, I heard one. I heard one encore. Is that seconded? Is the motion seconded? I don't know how encores work. Like an encore. Okay, there we go. All there right. we go. Uh, well, if we have an encore, maybe I'll go back to the original Joe book and see if we can find one. And nice. uh, and since we're uh, uh, since we're um, since since we're in Boston. <laughs> um, We'll do another Irish Joe poem. Uh -huh. Just called Joe the Poet in Ireland. And you may, if you're familiar, if you're Yeats and Salford, you'll, you'll recognize some of these illusions. Uh, <clears throat> or you won't. Uh, after visiting the grave of O'Sheen and leaving there three hawthorn berries, a tin of smoked salmon, and a penciled poem, and after sleeping six nights on the brow of fairy forts, and a seventh under Thor Ballet Lee's parapet, illumined by a midsummer moon, Joe descends to the cool damp of a pub's beer cellar, where he will refuse all food and drink, till he composes in the mind's eye 100 necessary lines. Thank you all. And thank you, Chad. Thank you very much, John. That was fantastic. His new poet is, his new book is Joe Rides Again. It's available from Foothills Publishing. There will be links. There will be copies of the book tonight. Uh, the Poetry Playhouse is the link. Uh, that's just been reinserted. Um, not too long ago, I think, by Jules. Thank you, Jules. The, um, oh, and there's also a G. Schwartz review included. Uh, this, is a, this is a fantastic way to end the night, a fantastic way to begin National Poetry Month. So I thank you for this, and I hope you can stop by again at some point uh, during this year. I don't know how much longer we're going to be an all-inclusive, all-online-inclusive uh, place, but even when things do let up, I do guarantee that we'll be meeting online in some capacity even when we go back on the stage. Yeah, the same with our cactus uh, open mic. We're going to try to figure out some way uh, to... Um, some way to have a hybrid. We're not sure exactly how yet. Well, thank you all very much for coming here tonight. For those of you coming to Stone Soup for the first time, I guarantee you there'll be some fantastic features coming up and some incredible announcements coming up for, for May. <coughs> Stone Soup celebrates its 50th anniversary. That's 50 years of Stone Soup. God knows how many weeks. Somebody do the math. I'm not doing the math. I'm a poet. But the, um, but it's a, and two weeks from now, we have David Leo Seurat, who has not only been uh, traveling these past few years, I think he settled down in Canada now, he used to be from New England, uh, spent some several years in Paris, and now is not only coming out with a new book, but he's also setting up a new international uh, open mic which I'm sure he'll be glad to tell you about then. We've already talked about like 20 open mics that everyone's doing, uh, or 20 and venues. So I'll leave David to make the case himself when he comes on the 28th. Before that, we have uh, for the 21st, Gloria Monahan, a teacher, poet, a workshopper. You can uh, see links to her uh, Twitter webpage and to her uh, Facebook page. She is a fantastic teacher and ad poetry advocate. You'll probably see a few of her Wentworth students or her Wentworth worthies uh, contributing some poems. Some of her students have even come on, gone on to read at the Stone Soup Open Mic or even contribute to Oddball Magazine. So she really does plant the seeds and she's been a Stone Soup advocate for as long as I've known her, if not longer, much longer. So those will be two features to close out April. And as I said, the uh, May features will be coming up very shortly. I will, I, I do thank you and I do encourage you to make a donation to the, to the, uh, to the Playhouse. And, and it looks like if you want to save this chat, click on the three dots according to Jules. And don't worry for anyone who has missed a few, a link here or there. If you do, if you're not able to put it on Snow Soup uh, Poetry page yourself, I will be including those links tomorrow when I include the uh, information for uh, for the YouTube link and, and all that stuff. 
So thank you for that. And thank you all for coming out. This is a fantastic night. And let's do it again next week. I'm not sure who the feature is because again, we had to change a date for David. So, but hopefully next week will, as a matter of fact, I know next week will be phenomenal, whether it's just you guys coming for an open mic or for we, we get the features that I want. There's been a lot of things happening on a national level. And I do have certain people who I want to comment on that. That's all I'll give for a preview for what I hope will be next week's piece. And it's also hopefully sets the tone for the rest of the year because uh, when we got together for the pandemic, we were sharing a lot of unique voices and we were able to come on and everything that was happening live and uh, share a living document of that. And I want for this live venue, as well as the snow soup uh, uh, in-house in gatherings to continue to do that. I hope you guys can be a part of it on some level. This is the part now where I asked everyone to go do a little wave as uh, for a little photo for tomorrow. So many, so many new faces, it's good to have you there and stop because I have, because it's hard to get a way of blurry hand uh, and a good screen capture. So thank you guys all for participating. Thank you so much, John. We're gonna do this again uh, sooner than you think. Definitely get a copy of Joe Rides Again, get Joe the Poet, support Foothills Publishing. These are the guys that's, you know, as someone who is, who has books available on Amazon, this is a guy who is, this is a publisher uh, who has said suck in Amazon and does everything through PayPal and their own websites and have been doing it since the very beginning. So support them as well. Thank you guys very much. And as uh, another problematic cartoon uh, has once said, the show's over. We see you next time. Have a good night, everyone. Night. Thank you.